Hey, this is Scott Smith, of the Scott Smith Blog. Today we're going to be going over Our Lady of Fatima and Mary's special connection to Islam. So we have four topics we're going to cover. Number one, the difficulty in converting from Islam to Christianity and the historical development of Islam in Western Europe. Number two, the special significance of Mary in the Quran. Number three, how little Fatima Portugal got its name. And number four, the surprising top destinations for Muslims, particularly Muslim women, on pilgrimage. So stay tuned and we'll cover all that. We're going to be drawing a lot today from the Venerable Fulton Sheen's book, The World's First Love, about Mary. Interesting side note about the Venerable Fulton Sheen, my wife and I went to Rome for our honeymoon. We went as Spousy Novelli and we attended one of the Wednesday audiences of the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI. And it just so happened, at that Wednesday audience, a contingent from the Diocese of Peoria, Illinois, was also there. They were there to present the cause for canonization of, the, of Fulton Sheen to the Pope. So it was that cause for canonization that was presented that got the ball rolling for Archbishop Fulton Sheen to become Venerable Fulton Sheen. Hilaire Belloc, an Anglo-French writer, described Islam as a heresy. Fulton Sheen says that if Islam is a heresy, it's the only heresy in history that has never declined. He says that every heresy has started with a, a moment of vigor and then gradual decay until eventually the heresy just evaporated into some vague social movement. But Islam has never declined. In fact, it's been constantly expanding from the beginning. God wills it. From its beginnings around 600 AD, it entered into a period of rapid expansion across northern Africa, through the Middle East. Islam expanded up both sides of Europe, along the Iberian Peninsula in the west and up the Balkan Peninsula in the east. This happened from about 700 to 1400 and even continued into the 19th century. Eventually, Islam was stopped before it was able to take over all of Europe, thankfully. Islam was stopped at Austria, and it was stopped along the Iberian Peninsula at the Battle of Tours. It took about 700 years, but Spain and Portugal were able to reconquer Spain through the Reconquista from 700 to 1492, a year that's got significance because of Columbus. So with all these centuries of Muslim expansion into Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, Christianity has basically failed in it, any of its attempts to evangelize Islam. Why has Christianity failed to stem the tide of this expansion through conversions? Here's part of the reason. For a Muslim to convert to Christianity, it would feel to them like they're taking a step backward. Fulton Sheen compares that kind of conversion to a Christian converting back to Judaism. Now, none of this really makes any sense because Muhammad is only a prophet, the last great prophet of Allah. But Christ was much more than a prophet. Christ was fully God and fully man. So for uh, a Christian to convert to Islam, it would be like going from Jesus back to John the Baptist, who is just a prophet, though the greatest of all prophets. So Fulton Sheen believed that Muslims will eventually be converted to Christianity. But the interesting thing is, he doesn't believe it's going to happen through direct evangelization. He believes it's going to happen through a summoning of the Muslims to a veneration of the Mother of God. So wait a second. If Muslims won't convert because of Jesus, what makes us think that they'll convert because of the Blessed Mother? This brings us to the second part of this video, Mary in the Quran. Amazingly, Mary holds a very exalted place in the Quran. She is the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran at all. And she's mentioned over 70 times in the Quran. What's more, the Quran even names Mary explicitly as the greatest of all women of creation. Isn't that incredible? While Protestants have rejected a number of Marian doctrines like the Immaculate Conception, the perpetual virginity of Mary, and the Assumption of Mary, Islam holds all these to be true. 
Amazingly, the Quran makes such a full-throated defense of Mary's virginity that the Quran actually blames all the bad stuff that happened to Jews because they did not believe in Mary's virginity. Interestingly, the Quran's likely not citing the New Testament when it talks about Mary. Instead, it's citing an apocryphal work of Mary's childhood. We know this partly because the Quran is quoting Saint Anne, the mother of Mary, and we only know that Anne and Joachim were the parents of Mary from this apocryphal work of Mary's childhood. The Quran cites St. Anne as saying this, O Lord, I vow and I consecrate to you what is already within me. Accept it from me. And then, upon the birth of Mary, St. Anne exclaims, And I consecrate her with all of her posterity under thy protection. O Lord, against Satan. Now, isn't that interesting? Against Satan. That sounds like a reference to Genesis 3.15, where God says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. The woman is going to be enemies with Satan, enmity. The Quran also includes a passage where St. Joseph is asking St. Mary, and honestly, I'd be asking the same question, how Mary was able to conceive without the help of a man. This is how Mary responds. Do you not know that God, when he created the wheat, had no need of seed? And that God by his power made the trees grow without the help of rain? All that God had to do was to say, so be it, and it was done. So the Quran describes, a lot like St. Luke's Gospel, all these pivotal points in Mary's life. The Annunciation, the Visitation, and the Nativity. Angels are depicted as addressing the Blessed Mother and saying this, O Mary, God has chosen you and purified you. He has chosen you above all the women of creation. Isn't that incredible? Above all the women of creation? Doesn't that remind you of St. Elizabeth addressing Mary as blessed are you among women and blesses the fruit of your womb? Or even Mary in her Magnificat, all generations will call me blessed. Even the Quran talks about Mary's connection to all creation. To Muslims, Mary is the greatest woman ever. Isn't that amazing? She is the true Sayida or lady. Mary is numbered among the four greatest women in all of Islamic history. The only serious rivals to Mary would be Muhammad's wife and Muhammad's daughter. Muhammad's daughter's name is Fatima. What's interesting though is that on the list of the four greatest women in Islamic history besides Mary, Muhammad's wife, and Muhammad's daughter, Muhammad's mother is not on the list. Isn't it interesting that Muhammad is the greatest prophet of all time, but it's Christ's mother who's on the list and not Muhammad's mother? After the death of Fatima, Muhammad wrote, Thou shalt be the most blessed of all the women in paradise, after Mary. Fatima herself is even known to have said, I surpass all women except Mary. Mary is also called the Rakia which is a title based on the extraordinary way that she bowed down. So the way Mary bowed down, she is said to have put her forehead, her hands, and her knees to the ground. Now, isn't this amazing that the iconic way in which Muslims pray is based on the Virgin Mary? Isn't that amazing? One last title of Mary that I'll touch on, there are others, but this last one is Sa'ima. She who fasts. Some Muslim traditions record that Mary, Sa'ima, fasted for half of a year. So even to this day, pregnant women and those preparing for pregnancy in Morocco and other Muslim nations will fast according to Marian tradition. Maybe not for half of a year, that's kind of crazy, but they still do it in honor of Mary. Now, isn't that interesting? Where then do you think Jesus first learned the tradition of fasting? Why did Jesus go into the desert for 40 days? Maybe it was a tradition taught to him by his mother. So this brings us to an important question, and this is how Fulton Sheen phrases the question. Why would the Blessed Mother have revealed herself in 1917 in the insignificant little village of Fatima so that to all future generations she would be known as Our Lady of Fatima. Remember, this is the same Fatima who said, 
I surpass all women except for Mary. So this is how Fulton Sheen answers his own question. Since nothing ever happens out of heaven except with a finesse of all details, I believe that the Blessed Virgin chose to be known as Our Lady of Fatima as a pledge and a sign of hope to the Muslim people, and as an assurance that they, who show her so much respect, will one day accept her Divine Son too. So what evidence does Fulton Sheen have for making that pretty bold statement? So we've already talked about how the Iberian Peninsula had been conquered by the Moors, a Muslim people. And the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, fought the Moors for over 700 years to retake their land from the Muslims. That happened between 700 and 1492. 1492 is the year that the Reconquista was completed by King Ferdinand and Isabella, but it's also known as the year that Columbus set sail for the New World, also under the patronage of Ferdinand and, and Isabella. So at some point in the middle of that, between 700 and 1492, in the 1100s, Portugal was able to retake its land from the Moors. So this is where the story comes to the little village of Fatima. So the story goes that an Arab princess fell in love with a Christian knight. And as the Moors were retreating from Portugal, that Arab princess refused to leave her lover's side. And she converted to Catholicism. They married, and that Christian knight then named the town, because he loved her so much, he named the town in her honor. Her name was Fatima. What are you looking at? So that's why Fulton Sheen thinks that Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima, is going to have some special connection with the conversion of Muslims. But it's not only that. For years now, plane loads of Muslims, especially Muslim women, have been traveling to Fatima, Portugal to see Our Lady. And not only that, the Blessed Mother has been very active throughout the Middle East. There's also Our Lady of Lebanon. In Harissa, Lebanon, Iranian women constantly come to pray to Our Lady, to the point that the rector of the shrine has a chapel especially prepared for them with icons, signs, and prayers to the Virgin in Persian to facilitate their devotion. Popular devotion to these appearances of Our Lady, as well as to St. Charbel in Lebanon, have been growing among Muslims in the past decades, much to the chagrin of radical Islamists. This is why ISIS and their ilk will destroy holy sites like these, sites of popular devotion, because they know the power that they have. All I can say is ISIS better not mess with the Blessed Mother. I don't think they know who they're dealing with. Isn't all that amazing? Can you believe that the Quran has so much to say about Mary? Can you believe that she's held in such high devotion among Muslims, even to the point of Muslims coming to Mary in holy sites? I think, as Fulton Sheen says, there is a tremendous amount of promise for the conversion of Islam to the intercession of Our Lady. So what do you think is going to happen with the 100th anniversary of the appearance of Our Lady of Fatima coming up on October 13th? Please let me know. Comment in the, in the box below. If we're on YouTube or if you're watching this directly from my blog, please add some comments down there. Also, if you haven't already subscribed to my blog, please do so. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you're as excited as I am to learn about all these connections between the Blessed Mother and Islam, and especially excited about the hope for our future. Take care, and Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us.